Uh, welcome to the Free Library of Philadelphia Online. My name is Jason Freeman, uh, and I'm pleased to be here to introduce tonight's guest, Mark Bookman. The Executive Director of the Atlantic Center for Capital Representation, Mark Bookman is an internationally renowned expert on death penalty law. He served for 17 years in the Homicide Unit of the Defender Association of Philadelphia, providing legal representation to many clients facing the possibility of the death penalty. A sought after speaker at numer numerous legal conferences and trainings across the country, he has published essays on various aspects of capital punishment in the Atlantic, Mother Jones, and Vice, among other places. He joins us tonight with his new book, A Descending Spiral, Exposing the Death Penalty in 12 Essays. Uh, these 12 essays expose the tragic absurdities, unfortunate human instincts, and systemic criminal justice failings that undercut the logic and fairness of the death penalty in the United States. One review says, quote, with lucid prose and a firm grasp of history and legal precedent, Bookman makes a persuasive argument that these dozen cases are just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to death penalty injustices. This is a cogent and harrowing primer on what's wrong with capital punishment. Uh, end quote. Uh, tonight's author will be in conversation with Reggie Shuford, Executive Director of the American Civil Liberties Union of Pennsylvania. Prior to this, he served as the Director of Law and Policy at the Equal Justice Society and was Senior Staff Counsel in the National ACLU's Racial Justice Program, among, among many other positions. So let's get right to it. Uh, Mark, Reggie, thank you both so much for being here and uh, take it away. Thank you, Jason. Thank you for having us. Mark, are you ready to do this? I certainly am. All right. OK, let's do this. So um, let's just go ahead and get out of the way that we know each other, right? So we're not complete strangers. Um, and I have to admit, I was deeply honored when you asked me to, to be in conversation with you. Um, I was already was a fan. I. Say it again. As was I. Well, thank I you, was sir. Happy. Um, I was already a fan before I read the book, but um, I'm a bigger fan now, I have to admit. Um, you know, uh, so Jason mentioned the name of the book um, in his introduction, um, and I love it. And um, I'm someone who often quotes Dr. King, uh, and even in my high school um, yearbook, my quote was, I had already decided I'd be, to be a lawyer, and my, my quote was, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere, right? The, one of the better known ones. I think the one I typically use now is the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice, which is another fairly um, well-known dark. He has many of them, obviously. This is one I had not yet heard, and so I'm, in, I'm interested in how you seized upon upon that for the title of this book. So just, just so everybody knows the, the quote, I, I want to read it. Uh, I, this is not the full quote, but just the, the, the particular sentence that's, that's relevant to the title. The ultimate weakness of violence is that it is a descending spiral, getting the very thing it seeks to destroy. So, you know, I mean, for me, boy, that just sums up the death penalty so perfectly. You know, we, we, we're, we're responding to violence with violence. It's, it's never worked in, in the history of mankind. And so it's just, it's such a perfect quote for the hypocrisy of the death penalty and, and what's profoundly wrong with it, I think. Yeah, I was really struck by it. it. There's also something beautiful about the way that it sounds, right? Which is not a surprise given Dr. King's um, grasp and use of language. Um, not really a surprise, but it's, it's, it's beautiful language. Um, used though, right, in a context describing fairly horrific things. And, and, and one of the many things I liked about the book was that it, did, that it didn't shy away from describing the horrors of, of, of some of the, the crimes that, that you know, folks sentenced to death row had, had, had committed. Um, but the book didn't stop there. It wasn't like, this is the crime, it is horrific, end of story. I think you took great pains to, to humanize um, the folks that you talked about in the book. And I'm wondering, I assume it was a, a deliberate choice on your part to do that. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering what was, your, what was your thinking? So, you know, it's, it's, it's really, 
I mean, there's two parts to to it's two parts to your question, really. The first is the, the nature of these crimes. And I'm not naive about kind of the devastation that gets wrought by these crimes on the victims, on the community, on the defendant's family, and on the and on the, the you know the, the person that is accused or guilty of that crime. So I'm not somebody that's naive. And I don't think that everybody uh, on death row is innocent. I think that, that there is certainly a, a discussion of innocence in the book and, and we may get to that. But at the same time, uh, um, these are horrific crimes. And I never want it to be acute. You know, when you write essays like this, there's always, there's always the possibility that someone's going to accuse you of tunnel vision or of not being fair to, to both sides. I never wanted to be accused of that. And I think it's important that we come to, to grips with that because the, as you say, the question does not end at the nature of the crime. Uh, it, you know, if we're not looking at the human frailty that has led someone to that place, then we're, we're not doing justice to the, to the, to the crime, to the story, uh, uh, or to the nature of the system of justice. So I was very careful to talk about the nature of these crimes at the same time, really important that we understand that that's not where the, that's where the story starts. It doesn't really end there. Well, one of the things that I found striking though not really surprising was how hard a life many of the people on death row themselves, right, had been had been victims of some really horrible, not, not trying to put them on par with each other, right? But many of them had experienced some really, really troubling lives, and including really abusive childhoods and, you know, uh, all of those things. And, and I think you're taking the time to just show that, right, um, was really, really helpful. Um, yeah. So, so, you know, I, I've said for years, and I, I hope this doesn't sound glib because I don't mean it to be, that no one wakes up one morning and takes an Uzi to the mall. Uh, you know, when you, when, when you hear a horrific story, you know, many, many things have happened to, to take the, the person to that place. And if we, don't, if we don't understand what's happened, and if we don't understand the, the, you know, the violence that's been wrought on that person, before, uh, uh, you know, before he or she has done something awful, then we're not, un we're not understanding it. It's not an, it's not an excuse. Uh, right. People, pro, 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 pro death penalty people like to say that we're, that we're creating an excuse, the, the abuse excuse, for example, which I'd love to talk about. Um, we're not. It's not, an, it's not an excuse. It's an explanation. And if we ignore the explanation, then we're ignoring, you know, the, the nature of the offense itself, I think. Right, and I think obviously if we ignore the full story, right? I think if, if nothing else, it's, it's humanity. It's just understanding who we're talking about and, and why people do the things that, that they do. And if we are interested in justice, which I think is a value that most Americans talk about, then I don't know that we can ever really get to justice if we don't really understand why something happened um, in, in the first place. Um, so, you know, but I'm preaching to, I'm preaching to the choir. <laughs> I'm preaching to the choir. I know, and I know that there are folks who, who, um, adamantly disagree with the both of us on that. Um, but it was very striking to me. I, I felt like I learned even for someone like myself who has been, you know, um, someone who studied capital. In fact, it was going to be my honors thesis in college. And then I got, I got senior writer. So I, I abandoned it, but, um, but I've always, you know, felt it, it was a stigma on our society. Um, so, you know, just exposing kind of where I'm coming from in this conversation. Um, so it, even, and, you know, obviously you and I are connected through our work against the death penalty. Um, and, um, but even so, uh, I this book was really eye-opening and illuminating for me, someone who's paid attention to these issues for a very long time. So I think there was something in the book for everybody, someone who's a novice in this area and someone who's fairly seasoned about the themes that kind of um, were illuminated in, in your book. What do you say, what do you say to that? 
I, I think, you know, I mean, we're, we're, we're always in sort of a false, du I mean, the modern age is like an age of false duality where everybody feels like there's two sides to every coin and we got to spend an equal amount of time on, on both sides of the coin, which is it, just not the case. I, I come from the perspective, and this is, you know, decades of working on this issue and, 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 and intimately with this issue, um, that the more people know, the less inclined they are to think that, that, that capital punishment is a good, a good public policy. Uh, it's just, you know, so from, from that perspective, if people read this book, that I, think, I think people are going to learn something about it. And I think the more they know, the more they're going to realize that this is just a failed public policy. And, and that's, that's really the bottom line. I, I'm hoping that people just, just familiarize themselves with the facts of capital punishment. That, that's really all we need to prevail in this issue, in my opinion. Yeah, listen, I agree with you 100%. I, I think, though, that, <laughs> that not everybody is interested in facts, right? Not everybody wants to know the full story. I, you know, I think, and I don't want to get us too off topic, but even, if, even as we look at um, this wave of um, trying to deny like true and accurate American history from being taught in school, there's a version of the facts, if you will, alternative, alternative or whatever you want to call it, um, that people um, it, attach themselves to, it seems to me, um, and, and uh, spin a narrative around those facts that they don't really want to let go. And one of the things um, in, in reading the book that, um, as a lawyer myself, um, it really is all about the facts <laughs> and the evidence. So I think we spend a lot of time really trying to understand what actually happened here. You need to do that, right, as a lawyer to, to, to lodge the best defense for your, for your client. You need to know what happened, right? Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I sort of, I don't know if, you know, if this is a good time for it. You're really, you're kind of getting to one of my essays, the, the last one in the book, which is really the autobiographical essay, the only one uh, about the facts, about, about what happened and, and, and the resistance to the facts, it, it, you know, not just, not just the crime, not just the background, but all the facts, the, you know, the, 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 the whole picture. And uh, uh, maybe, maybe you know, maybe we'll get to that, um, or maybe this is a good time for me to to read. I want to get to that. I want to get to that because I found the last because it was the last um, essay in the book um, and written from a really personal perspective. I want to I want to let's save that for a little bit, but I certainly want to get to there. But I I want to talk about this this question of of facts again because really that's kind of for, that's kind of a theme throughout the book. Folks don't want to be bothered with the facts, right? on appeal, did it really harm the outcome of the case? It's like facts seem to be inconvenient sometimes. There were judges who were predisposed to not wanting to hear more facts. If they heard more facts, they were like, this doesn't change the ultimate outcome of the case. So it won't, doesn't have any impact. So I think there's a theme throughout the book about the inconvenience of facts. This is one of the, this is one of the kind of pet Peeves, I think that a lot of that a lot of people that, that do what I do feel, which is the media has kind of concocted this this uh, uh, idea of that 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 technicalities are built into the law, and that there's this revolving door. Uh, uh, people are committing horrible crimes, and then they're getting released from 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 jail, and they just go in, then they go out, and they go in and they go out. And the reality, as I think the book makes pretty clear in a number of essays is that the technicalities built into the law are exactly the opposite. They're to stop the judges from hearing the actual facts. Uh, you know, there's nothing that, 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 that bad judges, and I put that in quotes, there's nothing that bad judges like to say more than, you know, this issue is waived. You, you, we, we, can't, we can't hear, we can't reach the merits of this claim because you're two days late or your lawyer didn't file it on time or whatever, whatever that technicality is, that's the hidden secret 
that no, you know, that I mentioned somewhere in the book about the, the judge in Texas who, um, you know, was told that someone was going to file um, a, a motion at five o'clock. And the judge said, uh, the court, court doors close at five o'clock. And they closed the doors at five o'clock and that person was executed. Uh, and, and two days later, the, the next person making the same argument did not get executed because they did it on time. So, you know, these technicalities are not just opening the, the, the courtroom doors. It's just a myth. Yeah, and when I read that essay, I thought, and I think also the very first essay, I thought, how arbitrary is this system? Depending on the state you live in, depending on the judge you get, depending if your judge wakes up on the wrong side of the bed. Um, I mean, should some, should the ultimate punishment be so subject to the vagaries of all of these inconsistencies, right? I mean, it, this, it, this is the ultimate, like, this is the ultimate penalty. The words you're searching for are arbitrary and capricious, Reggie. Right. That, that is what this is, right? I mean, so, so I, I'm guessing, I don't, you know, however many people are listening, I'm guessing they can't even imagine that in Florida, someone uh, uh, who went to trial received a vote of 12 nothing to live. And then that person got executed. And the, a co-defendant in that same case who got voted 12 nothing to die by the same jury, uh, by a different jury, was executed 30 years later. Uh, you know, it defines arbitrariness. And, and, you know, what kind of justice system can run on arbitrariness. I mean, you've put your finger right on it. All right, and also it's it's outlawed in some states <laughs> and not others, right? So and, and that, that's an important thing to point out. You know, Virginia, the state that's executed more than anybody else uh, uh, historically, uh, more than Texas by just a couple, um, they just got rid of the death penalty. Uh, a, a month ago, they just got rid of the death penalty. And I, you know, I have to say, I, 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 I don't blame Jason for this, but I cringe when, I, when, when he said I was internationally recognized. You don't have to be internationally recognized. The international community has already gotten rid of the death penalty. Absolutely. There, there right. is, there's no such thing as an internationally recognized death penalty expert. The international community doesn't need to consult with death penalty experts. They already know better. You know, the civilized world has gotten rid of this. We're, you know, we're in that group with uncivilized countries, for lack of a better word. Yeah, it's, it, and, it's, um, and it's, um, it's an embarrassing distinction, right? <laughs> to be for a country that touts itself as a world leader, it's an embarrassing distinction to be one of the few remaining civilized countries that, um, that still has the death penalty. What do you... Um, What's the state of what's the state of the death penalty here in uh, here in Philadelphia and Pennsylvania, Northeast, et cetera? So, so you know, Pennsylvania is the only we're a sore thumb in the Northeast. We're the only state that really has uh, 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 an active death penalty, and I'll get to that. What I mean by active in a minute. Uh, so, we're the only state that's really that's really engaged in the death penalty out of the entire Northeast and really below the Northeast. Like I said, Virginia's gotten rid of it, New Jersey's gotten rid of it, Delaware's gotten rid of it, Maryland's gotten rid of it. Uh, so, you know, we're really starting to stand alone in the whole Northeast corner of the, of the country. We just had a very important election uh, uh, two days ago uh, um, where, you know, Larry Krasner had won um, by, by taking the, a pretty firm position against the death penalty. He had a, a quote that I loved. He said he was tired of, of lighting money on fire. Uh, that's he, he basically saw the death penalty as throwing away money. And very expensive. Was, <laughs> very yeah, expensive. It's, it's much more expensive than life without parole. That's a little counterintuitive, and we can talk about that. But, you know, given, given all of the procedures that, that are in place and the necessary procedures that are in place, the death penalty is more expensive. It, this is just another fact that I think if people knew, they would, they would, they would look at the death penalty in a very different way. There's a there's a, a thought that it's cheaper. It's not. Yeah. Um, so, another so, inconvenient so, fact, Mark. Another inconvenient fact. Exactly. <laughs> so we, you know, a very important election passed. 
I think the the, the challenge to to Larry Krasner, I, I I I'm not a I'm not a Star Wars fan, although I may tell a Star Trek story later. Um, that was like the Empire striking back. You know, the city just the city just wasn't ready. Well, they were ready. As it turned out, they were very ready for the reforms that that Krasner has brought to this city. Thankfully, so right now we don't have a we don't have a death penalty. Pennsylvania still has a, a large death row, um, but there's a reality, and the reality is that Pennsylvania hasn't executed anyone involuntarily in almost 60 years, since 1962. We executed three people in the 90s who didn't, who, 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 who yeah. gave up their appeals, wanted to be executed. Beyond that, it's been 60 years since we executed anybody involuntarily. And you have to ask yourself, what are we doing spending this money for that? That's um, amazing. That, that really, that really is amazing. I, I, I am interested. So you mentioned that we don't have the death penalty. You mean Larry Krasner because he he's the DA is yes. a, is not going to call, call for the death penalty. But what That's about right. what about the state of Pennsylvania? So so the state of Pennsylvania has an active death penalty. There's Just over 50, that, yeah. over fifty cases right now pre-trial that the Commonwealth is seeking the death penalty. They're seeking the execution of a of a citizen. Over 50 cases. Uh, that's that's a, a huge amount. Uh, and then, of course, you look at the Trump administration, which just got done a murder. Before you go there, before you go there, just clarify something for me. Um, Governor Wolf, though, imposed a moratorium, right? You are correct. He has and imposed so a moratorium. What's the status of that? So, so that the, his moratorium was uh, what he said was. There's a state study that came out. It made a, a whole bunch of recommendations. And Governor Wolf said, look, I'm not contemplating capital punishment until, until those recommendations are implemented by the state of Pennsylvania. So far, not a single one has been implemented. So, so the, the moratorium remains in place uh, until I think until Governor Wolf leaves office, which I guess is you know, a year from now or a little more, not, not much. So we, we have a moratorium a, a, as we speak. Well, you know, again, talking about how our arbitrary and, and capricious, it, capricious the whole thing is, again, like elections matter, like who you, who's in office can determine whether somebody might live or die is, yes. is that's, a, that's, a lot to, that's a lot to contend with. Speaking of elections, speaking of elections, let's get back to the Trump point you were making, right? You, um, you, um, you, you mentioned, I think you're about to mention that he kind of went on a killing spree just before he left office. You want to talk about that a little? Yeah, you know, so, so in the, on the federal death row, um, no one had been executed since I think 2002, maybe 2003, something like that. And then the Trump administration in the last seven months of, of, of our former guy's term, uh, 13 people were executed. In fact, a number of people were executed after he lost the election. Um, so, so, you know, you're talking about a historic execution spree that, that we never saw federally over a hundred year period. And, 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 and in, in seven months, he executed 13 people on federal death row. Uh, really that, shocking. That's mind blowing. I mean, in a way it's not shocking, but it's really, it's really mind blowing, right? That that can happen in our country again, as we tout ourselves to be among the most civilized in the world, right? It's, it's, it's a duality of the, it's, a, it's really, it's, it's, um, it's it, not a surprise again. And it's, it's, it's who we profess to be and the reality of, of who we are is, is very, is very, very different. I'm interested in, in I don't know how closely you studied those, uh, those folks who had been who were who were killed by the Trump administration at a at a at a point I had looked I looked, um, and there, um, and that the majority of them were were black. Yeah, I don't yeah. know the exact numbers. I know they started out uh, um, executing white people, which is very common because that provides cover for the incredible racism I think that that lies at the heart of of capital punishment. 
Uh, um, so I, I don't know the actual breakdown, and you may very well be right about the majority. But there's uh, to ignore the the racism of the death penalty is to ignore the death penalty entirely, as far as I can tell. Right, and so I want to definitely want to talk about I definitely want to talk about that as, as a lifelong practitioner of racial justice, etc. I want to de definitely delve into that, and I, and I'll start by asking you this question. Um, to, to see, <laughs> I don't want to put you on the spot, um, but it's your book, and so maybe you, <laughs> maybe you, maybe you do know. Um, as you know, I'm from North Carolina originally, and I'm even though I now live in Philadelphia, as for you, um, I'm very still interested in Southern history, Confederate history, and I want to know whether, and I feel like I've heard this, I want to know the truth of this. Um, is whether there is a correlation between former Confederate states um, and the likelihood of the death penalty being um, given as a sentence to uh, in those places. So, so, you know, a lot of academics um, have concluded, I think rightly, that the death penalty is a kind of a legal outgrowth of lynching. And, 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 and one way that, that I've seen this uh, uh, depicted, you know, kind of in a, a pretty shocking way is to take a map of the lynchings in, in, in the United States. And of course, the, 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 uh, uh, Brian Stevenson and, and, and the, has put, uh, uh, you know, some amazing museums in, in, in Alabama that everyone should, should see. Anyway, if you look at a, at a, at a map of lynchings and then you lay, lay it over a map of, of executions in this country, it's a, it's a shocking overlay. Um, you know, it's duplicative really. And, and so there's very little doubt about that. And just, you, you mentioned North Carolina, I'll just tell you a, a fascinating little tidbit that just happened. Um, uh, two innocent people were, were uh, exonerated in North Carolina. Um, long story, uh, fascinating story, but uh, um, they were just rewarded about $10 million from the state for their wrongful incarceration, which of course does not make up for the lives that they were deprived of or, or the freedom that they were deprived of over decades. But, you know, so North Carolina, you know, Confederate state, uh, uh, I think the Confederate states, uh, you know, I'm guessing have, have probably a, a huge percentage of the executions uh, uh, over the, in, the, in the modern era, I think. Yeah, so I, so shocking to some, not especially shocking to, to others of us, frankly. Um, to me. Yeah. Right. So let's, there are a couple questions you want, let's take, let's take a couple questions and I, because I could ask you questions all night. I still have some I want to ask you, but let's, um, let's take some from the audience. Um, so Barbara Gold, uh, says, love to hear you also talk about the impact of police prison violence on those who commit it. Um, I'm trying to make sure I understand. Do you, do you, do you under, I think you understand? Um, I'm not 100% sure I, I, I get that. I mean, um, I, I, you know, if you're talking about sort of the, the, you know, growing up in a police state, which I think a, a lot of my clients have, you know, to, to some, I mean, you know, I grew up in Lower Marion. We have a very different impression of the police than if you grew up in North Philadelphia. And so, uh, um, and, and, and frankly, uh, you know, given that the violence that I think people undergo, that's what we term mitigation. I mean, that's, that's the trauma that has affected almost all of our clients. That's that's the story that oftentimes will lead up to the crime. Uh, uh, you know, that's that that kind of you know environmental violence, uh, you know, has a horrible effect on people. I don't think it takes I don't think it takes a genius to figure that out. I mean, it's common sense almost. Yeah, it's 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 devastating. It's it's sad. Um, it's a feature of American life, unfortunately. Um, and what's also said to me is, you know, we talked earlier about how you took great pains 
thank you to humanize everybody in your book. Um, and um, it's almost as if some folks' lives are sentenced from the just the beginning, right? From childhood to where they end up given the things that they experience. And a lot of that has to do with um, bad biased policing, right? I, you know, I think for those of us who work in this field, we know that every aspect of the criminal legal system is rife with racial disparities from one's initial contact with the police until the, you know, to, to the folks who dominate death row, I think, and, um, and everywhere in between. And, um, and it's almost like some folks just don't, don't get a fair shot at it. It's almost as if from birth, they're kind of predetermined to um, be on this path that it, that's gonna land them in some um, unfortunate places. It's certainly a higher hill to climb to success. Uh, that's for that's that's for sure. Uh, yeah, there, yeah I, think, I think we I think we got to do better. I think we've got to do better as a society by those by, by those folks. So let's let's move on to another question. It is: Do you think making all death penalty cases federal cases would solve any of the issues you're broaching in in our conversation? I don't know that you can just do that, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, federal federal death penalties are are at federal death penalty trials are supposed to be infrequent. You know, most murder cases are, are state matters. So federalizing all of those cases, um, first of all, it would, it would cost the taxpayer a fortune because the, the, the federal government spends a lot more money on, on capital cases than, 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 than Pennsylvania, which spends virtually nothing on them. And that's another you know, point of contention and why we've had so many death sentences followed by so many reversals, the lack of, of proper funding. So no, I, I, don't, I don't think that would be, that would not be a, a good solution, uh, I don't think. It's, it's also not a walk in the park, right? I mean, the federal death penalty, penalty, penalty isn't anything to write home about, right? I, I don't think we need more death penalty. <laughs> problem, so, yeah, um, right. I mean, I think as you mentioned, right, you mentioned that Trump and the Trump, the Trump administration um, and um, and just the last months of his administration carried out 13 uh, executions, which is striking. Um, and obviously there's something wrong with that system that that was allowed to happen, even after he lost the election in, 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 in November. So, so there's, I think there's some fixes for the federal death penalty as well. Um, another, but, but you mentioned about how much money is spent in Pennsylvania versus um, uh, elsewhere. And so our next question is, is why isn't the death penalty cheaper, right? We talked earlier about how it's more expensive than life on parole without the possibility of parole. Um, so the question is, can you take us through life without parole versus death penalty in terms of cost? So, so capital trials cost more money. They're first of all, they're longer, um, and there, there's there's so there's more to them. There's more preparation. And there's, so there's a lot more time that goes into it. And if it's properly prepared, it's expensive. Um, and then you've got, uh, uh, if, if the death penalty is achieved, you've got lengthier appeals. And some people suggest, let's cut those appeals short. That will cheapen the process. And it certainly will, it'll cheapen the process in the same way that if we take people out behind city hall and shoot them, that will cheapen the pro that will shorten and cheapen the process also, but the problem with that is, and you, one of the essays deals with this extensively, the Terry Williams case, which is uh, um, justice is not achieved right away. Uh, you know, if the prosecutor has hidden evidence, like in my opinion, in the Terry Williams case and many other cases, that's not found until decades later. So if we shorten the appeals process. Um, then we're running a, a much greater risk, and there's already a great risk. We're running a much greater risk that we're going to be executing either innocent people or people that should not get the death penalty. Um, and that's what the Terry Williams case was all about. So, so, you know, that's why the death penalty is more expensive. The trials are longer, the trials are more expensive, the appeals are more extensive, 
and death row itself is more expensive. Uh, the Allentown, the morning news in, out of Allentown uh, ran an article about how, how death row and the inmates on death row, that expense itself is $10,000 per year more for people housed on death row than, than not. And I'm guessing that's a low ball number. So for all those reasons, the death penalty turns out to be more expensive. And people should not take my word for this. The state of Florida did a study and found this. Duke University did a study and found this. It's not just uh, uh, you know death penalty opponents who were saying this. Yeah, I feel like I've heard I've heard that I've seen that data many other times before. Um, so you mentioned a couple of essays that, uh, in in the book. Um, so many that they're just all just amazing, and um, some I um, resonate more personally with me for one reason or another. Um, and I feel like I just, you know, for, for a number of reasons that I won't get into. But um, but one of the one of the audience members tonight wants wants you to um, pick your favorite. <laughs> Is it like picking your favorite child? I don't know. But um, the, which, um, yeah. so so the question uh, the full question it again, huh? I said it's a Sophie's Choice problem. Yeah, I can I can imagine. I, I you know. That, I mean, the one that stands out, the one that's different from all the others is the last one, the autobiographical one. I don't know if I would say it's my favorite, but it's, it's you know, if you put 12 of them together, that's the one that would stand apart only because of the nature of the way I wrote it, kind of. You want to talk a little more about it? I mean, you mentioned it earlier. or Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I, I mentioned it because we talked about the facts and getting yeah. into the facts. And that's, that's how the essay starts. Um, so maybe I should just, if, if you, I'll just read the beginning I of it. I love I that, read that'd be great, that'd be great. It's, it's, called, it's called Smoke and it, it is autobiographical. So um, it starts, one thing was for sure and two things were for certain. I could not represent Rafiq Fields if I didn't understand that he had nothing to do with the double murder outside the Red Rock Lounge in Northwest Philly. Not claim that he was innocent, not act as if he were innocent, not litigate to show his innocence, understand that he was innocent. If I could do this, if I could put aside all the lawyer crap I had learned over the years, all the tricks and deceptions, then I could represent Rafiq Fields. He made it sound like an honor. So we started out with a big problem because death penalty lawyers have a regrettable but understandable tendency to consider innocence the defense of last resort. We know that a failed innocence claim is the most likely path to a death sentence. Not only has the accused exhibited a lack of remorse, but he has had the unmitigated gall to try to trick the jury. No decent defense attorney starts out with an understanding that his client is innocent or any understanding at all for that matter. When it comes to the question of innocence or guilt, you learn the evidence, you scrutinize the evidence, you challenge the evidence, you might even be fortunate enough to suppress the evidence, but it is always about the evidence. I didn't say any of this to Rafiq Fields, however. Instead, I said, I do understand, but I could tell he didn't believe me. One thing's for sure, two things are for certain, he said. You ain't getting me to plead to this. I don't care if they offer probation. I had not even mentioned the possibility of a plea and probation for a double murder was an urban myth, but I nodded knowingly. This was the end of the beginning of my relationship with Rafiq Fields. And what a relationship it was. <laughs> yeah. Well, we'll leave that we'll leave that to the readers, but yeah, it was a roller coaster. We'll just put it that way. Yeah, I mean, I'm not, I'm not, I can't say that I'm surprised knowing you as I do. I mean, you do this work because you care, right? I mean, your heart is as big as they come. Um, you're trying to save people from being executed. Um, and, um, and, and I would just, we'll let the readers read it, but I will say he didn't make, he didn't make your job of representing him particularly, particularly easy. No. And you know what? That's, that's, that's common. And, and people should understand why it's common because, you know, I mean, and this is, you know, yet another problem with the death penalty. And, and I, I write about this extensively too. Many of our clients are, are, are either low functioning or severely mentally ill. Uh, um, and, uh, and, you know, get, I mean, 
it's not surprising when we see the, the nature of some of the crimes and, and, and that's, that's human frailty. So, you know, if, if you think you're, if you think you're going to the office, you know, and, and, and getting the guy who wants you to go in there and write a contract for, for, you know, whatever, you know, your next business opportunity is, you shouldn't go into, you shouldn't go into death penalty defense work. Just put it that way. Yeah. I, you know, I think throughout the book that for, for me, there are some, there are some patterns, there are some themes um, that arose and um, racism, um, prosecutorial misconduct, um, poor defense lawyering, um, and certainly, certainly mental illness. Um, I'm wondering if you're comfortable talking a little bit about Andre Thomas's case. Yeah, you know, Andre Thomas, it, it, that's a, and actually, I was, that's, I told you earlier that I actually had a funny story. It's related to that essay. Um, but, but it's not, a, it's not, a, I mean, Andre Thomas is a sad, a profoundly sad case, uh, a, a man with severe mental illness. And, and also, uh, uh, you know, the case has staggering racism in it. So Andre Thomas was a, a, a man who, who committed kind of a horrific crime, uh, uh, killed his, his, his wife and two little children, one of his own, um, removed their organ, removed their, their, their hearts um, and, and took them home in his pockets with separate knives because he thought it was a religious, uh, a, a, a religious issue for him. Um, shortly thereafter, he removed one of his eyes and years later, he blinded himself. Uh, um, and, and at the same time, three jurors that sat on his jury answered a questionnaire saying they're against mixed marriage. And he's a black man who was married to a, a white woman. Um, so, so, so three jurors are actually sitting in judgment saying they're against mixed marriage. And the defense attorney doesn't do a thing about it. Um, you know, such, it's such an extreme situation that the dissenting judge in a recent opinion cited the case of Loving versus Virginia, a case that wow. legalized, legalized uh, mixed marriage. You know, it, it's, this is only a month ago. So yeah. this, this is not old news. This is not, it's not history. This is happening today. Yeah, that's, uh, a, that's kind of scary. I think um, Andre's case actually kind of brings all of those, those themes together, mental illness, racism, uh, a, a defense lawyer who's not quite doing uh, their job. And I don't know if it's prosecutorial misconduct or not, but three out of four <laughs> of those themes are at least, are at least, are at least present. Um, you know, uh, I don't know if you knew, know this or not, but you mentioned um, Brian Stevenson's um, uh, museum. Um, there, so there's a legacy museum. Um, I've been fortunate to go a couple of times that it's about mass incarceration. We talked earlier about lynching. And so there's uh, the anti-lynching memorial as well. And I'm not sure you knew this, but one of the people that you talk about in the book um, accompanied me um, on a trip to both those places. Uh, and that's Anthony Wright. Okay. Well, so, so, so Anthony Wright is, there's a whole essay. Exactly. Anthony Wright. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, you know, and the Anthony Wright case was prominent in this last election because uh, uh, Larry Krasner's opponent uh, um, was the prosecutor the second time around who, who prosecuted Anthony Wright. The jury came back very quickly saying, the only verdict they could possibly render was a not guilty verdict. Um, but Mr. Krasner's opponent still tried to get a conviction there. And, you know, that was surprising to a lot of us, given the evidence. Yeah, I guess I kind of uh, <laughs> gave away the end of the story if I said that, that Anthony Wright and yes. I have been on, a, been on a trip together. So I apologize to the folks who've not quite got, gotten to that essay yet. But it's good news. I'm, I'm, I want to be the bearer of some good tidings. And so, yeah, I mean, the, the, the book, there, you know, it's hard to, there's not a lot of good news in a book about capital punishment. Right. Um, there's hope and resilience. But, but, you know, even in the best of worlds with a completely innocent person, that person is, is going to prison 
for sometimes a very, very lengthy period of time. So, it, you know, it's hard to, like I said, you know, there's, there can be a little humor, but it's, it, it's, it's rarely good news. I'll put it that way. Right. I think, um, I, I think that's, that's an important, um, that's an important perspective. Uh, let's go to a couple of more audience questions, if you don't, if you don't mind. Uh, and so Shelly McCabe writes, nationwide, do more citizens approve than disapprove of capital punishment? Do you know that answer? This is a great question, Shelly. Um, so, so, you know, one of the biggest problems is that politicians and prosecutors, many of them anyway, still believe that the death penalty is popular. And the reason they believe it is because when you ask people whether they're in favor of the death penalty, it's about, right now, it's about 55% that say they are. Um, and and, and that's, that's low because the number has been higher than that. Now it's down to 55%. But that's the wrong question. The proper question is, what do you think is the appropriate punishment for someone who's been convicted of the the most serious crime, the murder, the most serious murder. And when you ask that question, then the answer is, is about 40% for the death penalty, about 40% for life without parole, and about 20% for life with parole. So the majority of people, when asked the correct question, are actually not in favor of the death penalty. So I appreciate that question. It's important that we let our politicians know this is, there's no cachet in supporting capital punishment anymore. They just think there is, in my opinion. Yeah, it's very, very much akin to the tough on crime stuff, right? I mean, it's, the, it's all really the same stuff and um, people get rewarded for that. And, and, and even if it's not, again, based on, again, inconvenient facts, facts can be um, uh, inconvenient for folks. So let's ask, let's ask another question. Um, you know, I think even as we talk about how you, um, in my opinion, um, appropriately humanize the people in your book. Um, um, you know, I don't think you're saying everybody's a good person, right? You, you're not. You're not saying that. So, so the question is, what about someone like Ted Bundy? What's the argument against executing a person like him? So. You know, I did, uh, I did a, a, a debate years ago, uh, uh, and, and that, I was asked that exact question years ago. What about Ted Bundy, the poster child for the death penalty? And I'll tell your audience, you know, an ironic fact that, that people have forgotten. The prosecution offered Ted Bundy a life sentence. The prosecution did not try, did not go all out to execute Ted Bundy. If had Ted Bundy been less mentally ill, he would have been able to process the information properly and accept that plea bargain offered by the prosecution and would still be alive today. So, so you know, again, I, 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 first of all, I'm not, I'm not saying people shouldn't be punished. I, I don't think anybody has heard me say that. Some of these crimes are horrific and require punishment. Um, I'm just saying that capital punishment is not the way to go. And the prosecutor of Ted Bundy didn't think it was the way to go either. I never knew that. Thanks for sharing that. Um, and so I thought this, this is a take on one of the questions. Um, we talked about how the United States is one of the last remaining quote unquote civilized societies that still has capital punishment. Um, and the, the someone in the audience wants to know whether how, how we are viewed, do you know? Um, how we're seen kind of internationally, given that we still have it? And is, no. there pressure, is there any international, is there pressure from the international community on, on us to, to get rid of it? You know, I, I, I don't know about international pressure. I do know that there are a number of great international uh, um, uh, uh, organizations that, that try to help us with this problem. You know, the, an organization called Amicus. Uh, there was an organization called Reprieve. Um, so, so, you know, there are, in, in Europe, there are many people working hard to help us with this problem. They come over from, from, from the continent 
to help us with, with what they perceive as our problem, what I perceive as our problem also. So, you know, I don't know how much international pressure there is. I mean, our, our president, our, our president now has expressed his, you know, dislike for the death penalty. Uh, and I think, I think our attorney general did also. Uh, he said he was troubled by it. So, you know, whatever pressure can be brought to bear should be. Um, I think, I think our, our, our position internationally is an embarrassment to the international community. Yeah, um, that, that, that definitely makes sense. Um, so here's, a, here's another question from Robert Lamb. Uh, he said that, first of all, he said, hello. Hi, hi Robert. <laughs> um, so you talked, it's, you talked initially about the quote unquote justice of the death penalty. Um, I have to imagine that society feels avenged or safer by a death penalty from a horrific crime. How do we address that one? And so I wonder if that's about deterrence. I think you, I think you said at the beginning that it's never really worked. Um, but is there, is there some hunger from folks that, that, to, to, that'll feel safer if someone who's committed a crime is off the street or receives it, you know? You know, I, I mean, you're right. There, it's never been proven to be a deterrent. So we can kind of take that off the table. There's, there's no, there's no, uh, 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 there's no confident evidence that it's a deterrent. So leaving that alone, um, the, 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 um, the idea of, of being safer, we, we have some of the absolutely safest prisons in the country, in the world. Um, you know, some of the supermax prisons, uh, uh, you know, no escapes at all. So, so we can, we have clear, we're, we're clearly able to keep the community safe. That's not an issue. Whether or not we feel better about retribution is a different question. And I, and I think, you know, I think Clarence Darrow got it right a hundred years ago. Um, you know, when he said that we should not act as a heinous murderer acts. Uh, we need to, we need to be we need to be better than that. Uh, I, I tell a story about the Lion King. I don't know if we have time for this. The Lion King is a perfect example of the morality of, of, of the death penalty, it, 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 although it, it doesn't, jump out, doesn't jump out at you right away. But look at the story of the Lion King, which is that uh, a heinous criminal, Scar, uh, um, kills a, a, a great citizen, Mufasa. And then he compounds the crime by by framing Simba, by leading, leading Simba to think that he was responsible for killing his father. So it's a terrible, a terrible crime in every possible regard. And Simba grows up and he confronts Scar. Um, and, and, and there's a kind of a lion-like trial where they tumble around in the dirt. Simba ends up on top of Scar. And Scar says, what are you gonna do now, Simba? Are you going to kill me? And, and I, 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 I'll never forget this. I stopped the tape at that point. It was a, a, a VCR tape. And I asked my oldest daughter, who was six at the time, what do you think, what do you think uh, 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 Simba should, should do? And her response at six years old was, it's not nice to kill people, even if they're mean. So what does Simba say? Scar says, are you gonna, what are you going to do now, kill me? And Simba says, no, Scar, I'm not like you. Wow. And... And, 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 and then, of course, Scar refuses his punishment and tumbles to a lie in death, which is regrettable. Um, I don't think Walt Disney saw the, the metaphor that I was discussing. But um, be that as it may, imagine, imagine the, 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 the theater if Simba said, yes, Scar, I'm going to inject poison in your veins until you're dead. Every little kid in the theater would go running out, screaming, you know, to their parents. And, and, and so somewhere between the age of six and the time we become adults, we lose sight of the fact that it's not nice to kill people even if they're mean, you know? It's, 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 we shouldn't be acting like, like criminals. Yeah. Uh, you know, murderers cannot be justified. Some of the lessons we learned in kindergarten, we need, to, we need to relearn those lessons, it seems. So I know that we're almost short on time. You've asked most of the questions um, that our audience members had, um, but I, I want you to I want you to tell folks where you are now because you usually live in Philly and you, I don't think you're here. No, this is the first travel I've made in 15 months, and I'm uh, I'm I'm 
um, coincidentally going to federal death row tomorrow. So uh, to see a client, and, uh, so I'm in Indiana. Federal death row is in Terre Haute, Indiana. And uh, so, you know, it's relevant after, after uh, uh, the former guy, as, as we like to say now, uh, after the former guy killed 13 people on the federal death row, you know, that was a, you know, a shocking and appalling murder spree, as far as I can say. And so I'm seeing, I'm seeing someone there tomorrow and I'm looking forward to seeing him. So bless you for bless you for the work that you do on behalf of the Atlantic Center for Capital Representation. You want to say a little about Acre? Yeah, the the Atlantic Center for Capital Representation, which we call Acre, um, is is a, a nonprofit. Uh, people that are interested should go to uh, AtlanticCenter.org, uh, and we are dependent on the kindness of strangers. Um, and, and and you know to paraphrase Tennessee Williams. And so, you know, we, we survive on, on donations and we are a, a, a warehouse where we're a resource center for anyone facing possible execution by the state, uh, uh, pre-trial, post-conviction or, or whatever. And uh, so we've been, we've, been, we've been running it for uh, uh, 11 years now. And the slogan, which I like and which some of the people I work with are not thrilled with is, uh, trying to put ourselves out of business since 2010. And that's the goal. You know, we don't want to be here. No, no death penalty lawyer I know wants to be a death penalty lawyer. We're all ready to move on. And uh, if our government would just catch up with us, that would be great. Well, listen, I think I've enjoyed the conversation. I could ask you a million questions. Um, you talked earlier about ending on hope. I, by the way, I, I put the 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 um the link to Atlantic Center in the chat so everybody should be able to access it and go on and donate please do um but you talked about hope earlier can we end on on hope what how where do you find hope and and given given what you do and see every day so you know I mean hope can channel itself in a million different ways we have you know I mean like I said the fact that Virginia a state that executed more than any other state got rid of the death penalty just recently, you know, is huge uh, 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 grounds for hope from a public policy perspective. For me, I, I, you know, hope, I guess, springs eternal, but the resilience of the people that deal with this are, uh, you know, that's kind of a remarkable aspect of this work. You know, the, the people, and it's, I, I, I'm talking about about clients and defendants' family, victims' families who are enduring uh, a, a huge pain, uh, uh, other lawyers and, and, and mitigation specialists that do this work. There's a, there's a huge amount of resilience there. So, so you know, I'm optimistic that we're that we're that we're seeing a light at the end of this at the at the end of this tunnel. I was going to end on something that was funny, but uh, but maybe hope's a better way to to do it. Um, I hope that's okay. I hope that's okay. Pun not intended. Um, yeah. But I think that just to just to quote something from from the book, you said change is just around the corner. So I think I think we Virginia is an example. I think it does feel like like we can maybe that we can maybe get there. Right now, if you if you look at we have twenty seven states with a with a death penalty. Three of those twenty seven uh, uh, have moratoriums imposed by governors. So really, the majority of the states at this point do not have a death sentence, do not have a, an active death penalty. And that's, that's huge. And that number is only going in one direction. Uh, so w there is a light at the end of the time, no doubt. Well, I love that. I think I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna um, exercise my moderator's prerogative and embarrass you just a little bit because the reviews for the book have been phenomenal. And I'm just gonna read just some a couple of words and then we'll say goodbye to everybody who joined. Um, but beautifully crafted, some of the reviews say, formidable storyteller, uh, engaging, uses compassion, erudition, insight, brilliant, wry, powerful. Um, it's both literary and journalistic, devastating and illuminating. Um, so bravo to you. Uh, hats off, job well done. I've been a fan. I'm a bigger fan now. And again, I'm deeply honored to have been in 
conversation with you tonight. And thanks again to everybody who joined us. I've enjoyed it, Reg. Thank you for doing that. And thank the Free Library of Philadelphia and Joseph Fox as well. Um, and good luck seeing the client uh, tomorrow. Um, and remember everybody, go to www.atlanticcenter.org to um, help support the important and vital work uh, that Mark does um, and that the center does. Thanks everybody. Have a great night.